Okay, everybody, today I'm doing a book review of The Song of Achilles. And there are going to be two things that are different about this book review from the past reviews that I've done. First up, I didn't take notes as I go along in this book, and because of that, I'm just speaking off the cuff. I don't have a huge pile of notes in front of me like I have in the past. And in some ways, I think that might be a good thing, because thinking back on the one I did for The Oath, and looking ahead to a book review that I'm planning to record soon, that one's going to be the Star Wars book review. I think having too many notes and over-preparing for this takes away from the quality of the video at some point. Like, when I was recording The Oath, I don't know if you could tell, it just felt, like, monotonous to me to record it. And if it feels monotonous to me, I can imagine it's not going to feel exciting for the audience. But we'll see how that one does. It doesn't have that many views yet, which I don't think is super surprising. But the other thing that's different about this one is this book is one that my girl girlfriend found on Book Talk and had me read. So this isn't exactly one that I've read before and specifically wanted to make a review of. It's not like a classic or a niche book that I specifically sought out. This is one of the more popular books, one of the books that all the Zoomer chicks on Instagram are reading. But nevertheless, among those books, I found that it does stand out a little. I, I, I was skeptical at first, because honestly, books she's recommended to me in the past include Verity, Forbidden, and They Both Die at the end, so she just has a stellar track record of recommending books to me. All those books have just crash and burn endings that just sucked a lot of the enjoyment out of it for me in the last few pages, and I gotta admit, this one also to some extent did that, but to some extent the author also brought it back. I think it's time for me to get into the plot before I start giving spoilers of the end, which it's a retelling of the Iliad to some extent, how many spoilers can I give, but then it's also written a little bit differently from the Iliad. This one's written from the perspective of Patroclus, who is a character that I didn't even know of before this book. He is a prince of one of the lesser Greek city-states, and he gets exiled, and the place where he finds himself after he gets thrown out of his own kingdom is the royal court of Phythia, where the prince of Phythia, Achilles, who is a demigod, has assembled a collection of boys who, similar to Patroclus, have been exiled, and he's training them up to fight. Now, Patroclus is not a fighter by any means. He doesn't fit in with them there, spends a lot of time alone, skips his classes, but there is a deciding moment where he and Achilles bump into each other, and he has a single moment of boldness where he asks Achilles to take him to his music lesson with him, basically asking Achilles to lie to him about where he was, why he skipped sword training. And that became the start of their friendship. We see Achilles really take Patroclus under his wing, both metaphorically and in some official capacity capacity, because he tells his father he's officially making Patroclus his companion. Now, in ancient Greece, this was not an unusual thing to do, and what that role entailed, Patroclus spent every waking moment with Achilles, almost. Slept in the same room, went to the same lessons, did the same things. Sort of an advisor, but then they slowly, gradually grew into gay lovers. Which, again, in the context of ancient Greece, was not unusual, and so that's a big part of why I can forgive the homo aspect of this book. Granted, I think the homo aspect of this book did go a long way to making this book a New York Times bestseller, one of the Barnes & Noble featured books. There is a huge modern market demand for that aspect of it, but hey, Broken Clock is right twice a day, and in this case it just happens to be historically accurate. So we have these teenage boys, gay lovers, one of them happens to be the prince of a city-state, and destined for greatness, and a demigod, and all that. And there comes a time where they come of age, and they are sent off to the mountain forest of a hermit centaur named Chiron, and Chiron starts giving them lessons in really whatever they want to learn. Achilles continues to train his fighting skills. Patroclus, meanwhile, learns medicine, and then they both learn philosophy. And they spend more than a year up on the mountain with Chiron, but then there comes a time where they are called home for something, and they think it's just going to be a one-day thing and then go back to Chiron, but nope. The drums of war are sounding. If you're familiar with the Iliad, you will know that Agamemnon's son, his wife has been kidnapped by the prince of a city all the way across the sea in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. The city is called Troy. However, at Helen's wedding, they just so happen to have gotten several dozen princes and kings to swear an oath that they will take up arms and defend the marriage, the union, of Helen with Agamemnon's son against anyone who would dispute it. Now, at the time that they made the oath, this was meant to be a way to ensure that all the other Greek princes would say that the marriage is fair, 
because she had so many suitors, she had to sort through them all, and there was fear that if she picked one, the others would rise up and dispute it and start conflicts with each other. So they had them all swear this oath that whoever she picked, they would respect it, they would take up arms to defend that union. But then, years later, we see all these princes grown up, including Patroclus. Patroclus did, in fact, swear that oath. And... Because Helen is kidnapped, they're all bound by oath to come and join the war against Troy. So they're all summoned, they all bring their own personal armies. Achilles drags his feet with that, he does not want to go to war, and there is question of whether Patroclus's swearing of that oath is even remembered because of Patroclus's exile. Even at the time, he was a weak figure, not a fighter at all, and still that is true. Yet he's companion to the most famous fighter in Greek history, well, well, it's debatable if he's the most famous or second most famous, because there was Alexander the Great, but one of the most famous fighters in Greek history is partnered up, has willingly chosen as his companion, this scrawny kid who can hardly hold a sword or a spear. But nevertheless, Achilles has to decide if he wants to go and fight. Thetis, though, his mother, one of the gods of the sea, decides for him. Thetis kidnaps Achilles, without Patroclus, of course, takes him to a far-off island kingdom, disguises him as a woman, and furthermore, because Thetis does not approve of Patroclus, Thetis basically forces Achilles to sleep with one of the princesses there of that island, and he has a son with her. Patroclus, however, tracks down Achilles. They spend some time together on the island, and it's pretty much almost concluded that they won't go until Odysseus, you remember Odysseus from the Odyssey? Yes, that Odysseus, who participated in the Iliad in this war on Troy, in his quest to go around and recruit even more princes, even more armies to join the grand army that's going to conquest Troy, he lands at this island, and he sees through Achilles' disguise that Achilles is really a woman, and he recognizes Patroclus, who swore the oath all those years ago, and he arm-twists both of them to come and join the army. And they do that. And somewhere in this turn of events, somewhere, I think it's somewhere on that island, actually, we learn from Achilles' mother that there is a prophecy about Achilles' life. If he goes to the war, he will die. However, if he does not go to the war, his vitality, his prestige, will wither. It will grow old and feeble and pathetic, and he will be remembered as a pathetic old man, which is in some ways, especially with that culture, probably considered a fate worse than death. But ultimately, despite the fact that Patroclus and Achilles know they will lose each other, Achilles knows he will die, Patroclus knows that his lover will die, they decide to go to war anyway, because neither of them can really bear the thought of Achilles growing old like that in that way. So they sail across the sea, they go to war, they start fighting, they stay there, build a camp on the beach, build like a whole mini city on the beach, and they're there for years and years and years. In fact, ten years is what the book says. And there's a couple different side plots, but one of the most important ones is one day after the raiding on all those outlying farms that surround the city of Troy, because Troy itself has walls to defend itself, but all the farms around it don't necessarily have that, one of the war trophies brought back, and the way they've been distributing trophies is piling them up, and then each of the princes take turns picking what they want. One of the war trophies brought back is a girl, a woman. And there will be many more to follow her, but this is the first one, and Patroclus takes pity on her and urges a Achilles to claim her as his prize, not to sleep with her, but to protect her from being raped by one of the other princes. So Achilles does just that, and right away we see Agamemnon, the king of the Greek army, the father of the cuckolded son, the son who is the reason for this whole war starting. Agamemnon sort of bristles at Achilles taking this girl for himself because he sort of wanted that. Flash forward a few years later, every day usually Achilles goes out to fight, usually Patroclus stays in the camp, he eventually learns to work with the doctors and be one of the doctors in the camp. But he also befriends this girl, and they learn each other's languages, at least a little bit. She learns a lot more Greek than he learns Turkish. Her name is Brzez, and she becomes a major character in this book. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that name right, Brzez. It is what it is. And over time, as their relationship develops, we learn that she starts to get a crush on Patroclus, but Patroclus is more than happy to stay with his gay lover, to stay exclusively with Achilles. However, during one conversation they have about it, he reveals that if he ever did want want to marry a woman, it would be Brzez. And now this conversation leads the reader to anticipate that Achilles will die during the war, Patroclus will survive, and then in his grief, Brzez will comfort him, they will grow even closer, and they will 
will get married and have a child, and we even see Patroclus daydreaming about that future child they might have. That is very much the expectation and the anticipation. More on that later, but the pivotal turning point, the beginning of the end, the spark to light the match, so to speak, comes when a priestess turns up on that pile of war trophies. Agamemnon claims the priestess, happens to be a high priestess of, I believe it's Apollo is the god in question. The high priest comes, lets him know that this is a priestess of Apollo. She has a holy duty. Her place is back in the temple. Please release this priestess. I'll even give you some gold for her. Agamemnon is stubborn. He says no. And then the very next day, the gods punish this Greek army by sending a plague. The plague continues on and on. It gets worse and worse and worse. Everybody's getting sick. Animals are dying. People are getting dying. And then Achilles, of all people, calls a meeting and tactfully as he can, because he does know the reason for the plague, but he has to bring it up tactfully. He brings the camp priest into it, asks him publicly in front of the whole army, hey, why are the gods displeased with us? Why did they send this plague? Oh, I think Apollo is displeased because Agamemnon took that girl. Oh, that makes sense. Hey, King Agamemnon, in front of all the army, I think you should release this girl and make amends, make a huge sacrifice to Apollo to try and win back our favor with the gods. Agamemnon throws a hissy fit in front of everybody. Does end up releasing the girl, but as revenge against Achilles, publicly announces that he will take Briseis, take her for himself, which is a major sting to Achilles' honor. Achilles is the best fighter there, everyone knows it. He has this title, Aristosakion, which means best of the Greeks. Everyone calls him that. And here's this king undermining his honor, undermining his prestige by taking one of his war prizes that is completely, fairly his. It belongs to Achilles. So Achilles and Patroclus go back to their army's part of the camp. They talk briefly. Achilles talks to to his mother, and the decision is made that they will allow Agamemnon to take Briseis, which Patroclus feels absolutely slighted by, but then again, Achilles makes the promise he will not fight again until Agamemnon comes crawling back on his hands and feet and begging Achilles for forgiveness. So we see both of these men with their pride and their egos, Achilles and Agamemnon, and then we see Patroclus who feels absolutely betrayed to the extent that he goes and tells Agamemnon, cuts his hand, uses the blood to swear an oath, tells him that the gods will punish him, and the army will turn against him if he violates Achilles' war prize. Agamemnon actually listens, and at the very last minute before he's planning to rape this girl, he changes his mind, does not return her, but starts treating her nicely, doesn't defile her, lets Patroclus visit as often as he wants. And for a long time, we see this tension grow, where Achilles does not fight, and the Trojans, their allies from the rest of Anatolia, start pouring in more and more. The tide starts turning, the Greeks are getting pushed back further and further and further towards their camp, further away from the walls of Troy, where they set up the battle lines every day, until eventually the Trojans are camped right outside the Greek camp. They're right at the walls of the camp. At this point, we see Odysseus and a few others come, make one last attempt to beg Achilles, please fight. They're going to get through the walls tomorrow. They're going to burn the ships. We need you. Achilles, in his pride, refuses to fight. Agamemnon has not come crawling back on his hands and knees begging forgiveness yet. Odysseus even offers the return of Briseis, but no, that's not good enough for Achilles. So the next day they wake up. Achilles and Patroclus are in a hill overlooking the camp. They see that the ships are starting to catch fire. The Trojans are coming in the camp, and Patroclus begs Achilles to fight. Achilles says absolutely not, and then he begs a second thing. He begs that he would be allowed to put on Achilles' armor and ride in a chariot so everybody in the army thinks that Achilles is fighting, but he's really not. And he uses his pride against him. He says that when the fighting stops and when everyone sees that it wasn't really Achilles, that the Trojan army turned around and fled and ran away just because they thought Achilles was there, even though he really wasn't, Agamemnon is going to realize just how much he needs Achilles, just how powerful even the idea of Achilles Achilles is, and at that point Agamemnon's gonna come back and beg. And Achilles says yes to this, but makes Patroclus promise not to try and fight, to stay in the back, not get himself in trouble, keep himself safe. Patroclus promises this, but then, of course, of course, Patroclus gets carried away. Actually does kill one of the Trojan generals, but then goes way too close to the city. There's a weird scene with him attempting to climb the walls of the city, and two times in a row getting knocked down by a literal Greek god, but after the second time, he realizes he's surrounded by Trojans, he's not going to, going to escape, tries to run away, gets caught, and we see him actually get a spear in his gut. Hector is the name of the Trojan that spears him, and Hector is an important character because one of the prophecies from Achilles' mother, Thetis, is that Achilles will 
will die after Hector dies. So all this time Achilles has been avoiding Hector. Hector has been considered one of the best fighters of the Trojan army, just like Achilles is considered the best of the Greeks. All these ten years Achilles has been avoiding Hector on the battlefield because he wants to prolong his life, or rather because Patroclus is begging him to prolong his life. But now that Achilles' lover has been killed by Hector, all bets are off. The very next day Achilles goes out war crazy, chases Hector down, goes way past, way into the back of the Trojan lines. Hector runs across this stream. There's a scene where Achilles is fighting one of the local Trojan gods, the god of this river that he's trying to cross, and Achilles, demigod that he is, actually does manage to wound this local god and make the local god retreat, and successfully cross the river, keep chasing down Hector. Kills Hector, drags his body back, and for the next few days, he spends his days in a chariot, dragging Hector's body behind him, going circles around the city to taunt Troy. And then he spends his nights in bed with the dead body of Patroclus. And throughout all this, Patroclus is still the narrator. Crazy enough, he's like a detached soul watching all this happen, but he has no power to influence anybody or anything. And there is a scene where the king of the city, Hector's father, the king of Troy, Priam, sneaks into the Greek camp at night, sneaks into Achilles' tent, and begs Achilles to return his son's body, and Achilles actually says yes to that. But then, the very next day, when Achilles goes out to fight, he is shot with an arrow by one of Priam's other sons, Paris. And this book, of course, we all know from the Iliad, the famous story of the Trojan horse, but this book actually leaves that as just a single sentence, yeah, yeah, the horse happened, the war got won, and all that, completely brushes over that. One thing that does happen before they brush over that is Achilles' son, remember the son that he left on that island? His 12-year-old son now hears that his father is dead, and he brings a small army there. It turns out the son has actually been raised by sea nymphs, which is kind of weird, and the son is at least as good a fighter as his father. So the son shows up, heart of iron, fist of steel, takes Briseis, tries to sleep with her, Briseis runs away, and he throws a spear and kills Briseis. So, at, at that point, at that point when Briseis died, honestly, it was like 10 or 15 pages from the end of the book. It was hard to continue at that point, but I was so close to the end, I just finished it. Uh, one of the other things this son does is he dictates where and how the monument to his father should be set up when they set up that memorial in Troy and they bury his ashes. The ashes have already been mixed with Patroclus' ashes, at Achilles' request. Pyrrhus disapproves of that, but he can't unmix the ashes at this point, but the very least he can do is make sure that the monument says Achilles' name only, but not Patroclus' name. After all, Patroclus is just a slave. Why should they honor him at all? Achilles is the important one. So, very bluntly, refuses to honor Patroclus at all. Patroclus is still a disembodied spirit watching all this, and the very last thing he can do, one of the very most insignificant things he's able to do, is keep Odysseus away awake at night with bad dreams, and then the very next day, the day before they leave, after they take the city, when all the ships are getting ready to go, the Greeks are going back home, Odysseus begs one last time this son of Achilles to do something to honor Patroclus. The son of Achilles still refuses. So now we see, at the very end of this book, this disembodied spirit hanging around the grave of Achilles, unable to go too far from that because that's where his ashes are. And who else but the mother of Achilles visits the grave every single day? We learn from the mother that the son of Achilles tried to get funny with one of the other Greek general's wives and got killed because of that. So, hot shot, fiery temper, 12-year-old kid. That lasted pretty long. And then, Thetis, because she's a god, she's able to see and hear the ghost of Patroclus. These two characters never liked each other at all, openly hated each other. But, they have no one else to talk to and reminisce with about Achilles, so eventually they do get to reminiscing. And Patroclus shares with her every single beautiful memory that he and Achilles made together, all the good times before the war started. And funny enough, all those memories actually do move Thetis's heart a little bit. And in the very last scene, we see her carving Patroclus' name next to Achilles on that tomb. And having a proper memorial is the thing that Patroclus's spirit needed in order to be released into the underworld and be with Achilles. But then, of course, Briseis is not there because she follows different gods. She doesn't follow the Greek gods. Oh, what a letdown. This book actually does do something that I really appreciate and I really wish more books did. The author specifically put guided reading questions at the end of the book, intending this to be read in a book club and discussed as a group. And the author, by the way, I don't think I mentioned before, is Brown University educated, Ivy League educated, and she studied ancient Greek and ancient Latin. She studied these ancient stories, and her specialty I was reading is retelling these ancient stories for a modern audience. 
I think she did a phenomenal job with that. I mean, I can't argue with how popular this book is, how many people are reading it. She very much succeeded in that goal. And the story sucked me in as well. But before I go through those guided reading questions, I want to get to two things. This might be minor nitpicks, and even so, it's hard to say what's right or wrong, what's historically accurate. In a story about Greek demigods, a story that we only have one source for it, a story that's so old we didn't even until recently know that Troy was a real city. But nevertheless, we've probably all heard the legend that Thetis dipped Achilles into a river to make him invulnerable, but the one spot where the water that makes him invulnerable didn't touch was the place where Thetis had her hand on his ankle, and that's where we get the Achilles heel. That is where legend says Achilles' heel was pierced by the arrow, and that's the thing that kills him. In this book, however, Achilles' death does come from an arrow, but it comes from an arrow through his chest, not through his leg. And I don't know why the author didn't include the thing about the leg in there. It would have been very easy to do, and I even saw it foreshadowed a little bit. One of the other minor Greek characters did get an arrow in the leg, from this same Paris that killed Achilles. But no, one arrow, supposedly guided by a Greek god who wanted revenge on Achilles for Achilles' dishonorable treatment of Hector's body, one arrow, one shot, one kill through his chest, not, th not through his leg. It differs from the legend that I knew. I won't necessarily say it's wrong or inaccurate or incorrect because, like I said, we don't know how much of this story is even true, but it differs from the legend I've always heard. And the second thing that differs is, I briefly mentioned Alexander the Great earlier in this review. Well, supposedly Alexander is a descendant of Achilles through his mother's line. His mother is a descendant of Achilles. Now, for that to be true, Achilles needed to have had a surviving child and in this book we saw the only son of Achilles killed because he acted like a hotshot and tried to sleep with someone else's wife. That is the other thing which differs from, I suppose, legend, as, as close as legend can be to being actual history. In order for Alexander the Great's mother to have been born and then Alexander the Great himself, we would have needed a surviving child of Achilles. But without further ado, though, let's go through some of these discussion questions. Number one, in the Iliad, Patroclus is a relatively minor character. Why do you think the author chose him to be the narrator? What other figures in the story might make interesting narrators? Certainly, Thetis comes to mind as a potential interesting narrator. I can certainly see why Patroclus was chosen. He is so close to Achilles, he's seen the entire story. Even after his death, we get to see him continuing the story as a ghost. And then, of course, there's the gay lover element, which the modern audience just eats that up. I'm sure she's gotten tons of book sales because of that. Odysseus could also be a good narrator, possibly. Odysseus doesn't have as much information on Achilles' early life, but he is the main star of the Odyssey, which I think this same author might have also done a rendition of. And also, Odysseus, we see him time and time again being a very diplomatic character. He convinces Achilles to join the army. He goes on behalf of Agamemnon to try and convince Achilles to fight. He goes on behalf of Patroclus to try and convince Achilles' child to honor Patroclus in some way with an actual tomb. Odysseus and Thetis would have been good narrators, Thetis, I say that because not only did she have a good view of the entire story, but she also has the added element of access to the spiritual world, access to what the gods are saying about all these events. We would have gotten a direct picture of how the gods were involved causing this or that, rather than just hearing bits and pieces of it from whenever Achilles goes to meet with his mother. Briseis would have been a good narrator for the second half, but not for the first half. We don't even see that character until all the characters are already on the beach at Troy. Question 2. Near the beginning of their friendship, Achilles tells his father that he values Patroclus because he is surprising. What do you think Achilles means by that? How is Patroclus different from the other foster boys? Why? Well, surprising because he has the boldness to ask Achilles to cover for him when he lies about not going to his sword lessons, because he has the boldness to ask Achilles to take him to that music lesson with him. Completely quiet otherwise, out of his element, doesn't fit in with the other boys, but yet has the boldness to ask the prince for that favor. I think that's the thing that really drew Achilles in at the beginning. He values the advice, the judgment, the counsel that Patroclus is able to give. He values that unique perspective and that boldness to say what he thinks. Question three, what do you think are the reasons behind Thetis's opposition to Patroclus? Well, the obvious Patroclus is not a fighter at all. He is completely out of his element in any kind of an army, almost never goes out to the battlefield, ends up being a doctor instead of any kind of soldier. It isn't even until the very end where Patroclus 
Patroclus shares all these memories of Achilles, really shows his love for the son, the child of Thetis. We really get to see Thetis' vulnerability as a mother and the softening of her heart towards him when she sees how much they care about each other. I think that part's sort of obvious why Thetis dislikes Patroclus. Question 4. How do the boys change during their time with Chiron? Do the centaur's lessons continue to be a guiding force in their lives? I don't know if guiding force is the right word, but certainly a formative element, a formative influence. And certainly, like, for them it felt like a whole year-long honeymoon. But then they also had philosophy and medicine and other kinds of training mixed in with that. So I would say the story was shaped by the characters, but the characters, to at least a lesser extent, were shaped by Chiron, but more by their time with Chiron. Question 5. On the island of Skyros, that's the island where Achilles tries to hide and disguise himself as a woman, what motivates Didymea's desire to speak to Patroclus alone? Didymea is the woman that Achilles sleeps with and has a child with. What does she hope to achieve? I really brushed over this story arc, but there was an arc where Didymea was jealous of Patroclus, jealous because Achilles doesn't really show interest in any woman, including her. She desperately wants his attention and his affection, and he just isn't able to give it even if he wanted to. But meanwhile, we see Pat- well, she sees Patroclus, who he does love. She sees the difference there, and there's a point where I think she tries to make Achilles jealous by luring Patroclus into her room and sleeping with him, which Patroclus similarly does not show interest in women, does it pretty much only because he got roped into it. So that was a little bit of a weird story arc to be sure. Question 6. To what extent does Achilles' ultimate destiny shape his choices? Is there such a thing as free will in this world? That is an interesting question indeed. It's one of those things where, because you know the prophecy, because you know at least part of the destiny, you act a certain way which is different from how you otherwise would have acted, but then you find the destiny fulfilling itself in an absolute absolutely unexpected way. We didn't expect Patroclus to die. And then the death of Patroclus really set in motion the death of Achilles, which sort of sealed the fate of Briseis. So as much as these characters try to either avoid or lean into their destiny, either way something unexpected happens. Their destiny sort of blindsides them and hits them like a bus. Question 7. Historical events can sometimes turn upon the will or personality of a single person. Aside from Achilles, are there other characters whose faults or virtues significantly affect the Trojan War's outcome? Come. Agamemnon, obviously, because he stole Briseis. Any number of characters, really. Question 8. Myths are often called timeless for their insights into human behavior. What parallels do you see between the characters and conflicts of this novel and today? What pieces of Patroclus and Achilles' story can be universalized? The first thing that comes to mind here is, of course, the timeless trope of star-crossed lovers dying together. Seeing Patroclus and Achilles being together in the underworld, the power of the emotions of that moment did bring to mind Romeo and Juliet it felt as timeless as that. And even for all the other parts of this book, that part will stick with me. Question 9. What is the significance of song and music in the novel? Well, one of the key items we see in the novel is a musical instrument that belonged to the mother of Patroclus, and when Patroclus is exiled and brought to Achilles, this instrument is one of the things that goes with him, and Achilles learns to play it, not even knowing the significance to Patroclus, this instrument, but later he finds out. And this music becomes one of the things that, at the very end, when Patroclus is telling all the memories to the mother, to Thetis. The music is one of the things that he brings up. Question 10. Patroclus is often self-critical narrator. Consider how other characters in the novel regard him. Do they see him in the same way he sees himself? I think he has a healthy understanding of his faults. I wouldn't say he's overly self-critical. He knows he's not a fighter, but that doesn't mean he's not bold. He's bold enough to go to Agamemnon and cut his hand and swear that oath. He's bold enough in the beginning to ask Achilles to cover for him when he skips his sword lessons. I don't don't see as much, perhaps, as the author does of Patroclus being self-critical. Certainly not to a fault. Question 11. As represented in the novel, what are some of Odysseus's defining qualities? Do you find him a sympathetic character? Why or why not? Well, as I said before, I think Odysseus is one of the most diplomatic characters. And I almost do want to read the other book she wrote, because it would be fun to see this story continued through the eyes of different characters, but with the same character, Odysseus, written by the same author, with the same quality imagined in the same way. I would enjoy seeing that. Question 12. Consider the explosive falling out between Achilles and Agamemnon. In what ways are each of them at fault for the rift? Could it have been avoided, or was it inevitable, given that Achilles' fate is determined? I could see how one would say it's inevitable, because even at the beginning, when Achilles took Briseis, 
the first time. We see Agamemnon sort of discontent with that. I think that really sets something in motion. There were opportunities where it could have been stopped, but then again, it wasn't. Question 13. Achilles and Briseis each claim Patroclus's loyalty and affection. In what ways are they similar or different? What are the dynamics of each of their relationships with Patroclus? Honestly, I think a lot of the readers would have been very happy if Patroclus could have lived in a three-way relationship forever, having children with Briseis, but also sleeping with Achilles. We see that Briseis would have been content with that as well, and I think Patroclus could have been talked into it. Briseis is a lot softer than Achilles, to be sure. Patroclus feels like the submissive one, the one that gets wounded, not the one that acts when he's alone with Achilles. But then when he's alone with Briseis, Patroclus feels more of an embodiment of that masculine role. Patroclus is in control. He's the leader. He's the one acting and responding to her emotions. He's the one that's not necessarily getting swept along with the flow of things. 14. What does the encounter between Priam and Achilles reveal about Achilles, why do you think Achilles grants his request? Now that's interesting, because we weren't directly told in the book why Achilles agrees to give back the body of Hector to Priam. Does he feel the disembodied spirit of Patroclus urging him to do that? I don't think so. Does he know what he knows of Patroclus and know that Patroclus would have wanted him to be softer in this situation? Maybe. I don't know if he's thinking that clearly, because at this point he is literally sleeping with a dead body for days in a row past the point where the body is stinking. I think that's going to be one of the mysteries of this book that never gets solved. 15. Near the end of the book, Odysseus comes to speak to Pyrrhus, that is the son of Achilles on Patroclus's behalf. Why do you think he does this? How does it change, or not, your opinion of Odysseus? It doesn't change my opinion of Odysseus. Rather, it solidifies my opinion of him as the great negotiator, the great diplomat. It reinforces what I concluded about him when I saw him coming to Achilles on behalf of Agamemnon. 16. Peleus warns his son that any mortal who visits the sea nymphs in their caves beneath the sea does not return the same. How is this belief borne out by the character of Pyrrhus, the son of Achilles, who was raised there? In what way does Pyrrhus confirm or deny Patroclus's fears about the gods? Well, for one, Pyrrhus is 12 years old. He's already as good a fighter as Achilles ever was. Good enough at fighting to fight in a Greek army, and even win the Trojan War for them. But then, I don't know if it's youthful indiscretion. I don't know if it's him just getting carried away with getting whatever he wants, like King Joffrey and Game of Thrones. But we see him being an absolute little brat, someone we want to slap, someone who just pushes his weight around and gets his way constantly, and no one can say no to him. That is, at least until he tried to sleep with that other guy's wife and got himself killed. So the character of Pyrrhus is interesting that in that way. I don't know how much of it is because of absolute power corrupts absolutely, and I don't know how much of it is because he spent that time with the sea nymphs. Question 17. In the final pages of the book, we learn more about Thetis. How does this affect our view of her? This is one of the few times in the book we see her really vulnerable, really letting her feelings be shown, not wearing them on her sleeve, not being vocal and pathetic about it, but the single act of putting Patroclus's name on the tomb next to Achilles. That shows that, as a mother, she can be moved emotionally by all those memories that Patroclus brings up about Achilles. It really humanizes that character. It really brings her into focus as a well-rounded, three-dimensional character, and the fact that she would allow Patroclus and Achilles to be together in the underworld for eternity after spending how many years opposing Achilles being with Patroclus in life. I think that's a powerful action, and I think that gives a lot of sympathy to her from the reader. And the last question, question 18, Patroclus tells Thetis that he is made of memories. What does he mean by that? What role does memory, both personal and cultural, play in the novel? Well, I would say memory is not exactly the same as a fact that actually happened, a concrete thing that is unchanging. Memory changes, and memory is the stuff that legends are built of. Think of the movie 300, and think of all these weird things that make us assume it's a purely fictional movie, but then at the very end we see it is the story. It is at least partly the true story, but it's the story as told from a veteran of this battle giving a pep talk to a second Greek army that's on its way to fight the invading Persians. It's sort of like that. It's legend and the lines between fiction and non-fiction sort of get blurred. That's how memory relates to the story itself, but how memory relates to Patroclus is 
I suppose at the time that he said that, being a disembodied spirit, all he had left were the memories of Achilles. And, of course, being with the only other person he could talk to, the only other person who knew Achilles as well as he did, all he could do was let those memories out. And I think all that Thetis was able to do in response to that was what she did. So, in conclusion, this was a very powerful story to begin with, and the story itself was given new humanity, new vitality into these characters by the author, and the author is extremely skilled at doing that. I mentioned she exploited the gay relationship angle for the modern audience, but m more skilled than that. Skilled enough to make me feel something at the very end when Thetis carves Patroclus' name into that stone. Skilled enough to make me want things desperately for the, some of these characters, and then be extremely let down when they don't get them. Skilled enough to make me truly grieve for some of these deaths. I do salute this author.